The last couple episodes of this series concerned the Carboniferous period. This was a time when plants sprung up like weeds all over the world with no herbivorous animals to trim them back or take excess oxygen out of the air. Consequently, atmospheric oxygen was up to 35%, the highest it's ever been before or since. Now, while amniotes and most other tetrapods had lungs, arthropods didn't. The scorpions are an exception in that they had gill fronds called book lungs. Not quite the same thing, but it does allow them to get bigger than most insects. Otherwise, if they can't absorb oxygen through their skin, they have to draw it in through pores or holes in their exoskeletons. So they can only be as big as their oxygen intake allows them to be. And that's why arthropods are comparatively small, even when they're found in the ocean where the water helps support their weight. But in the Carboniferous, there was as much as 15% more oxygen than today, and this allowed terrestrial arthropods to get much bigger than ever. Well, not 1950s drive-in movie big, but at least three or four times their actual size. So imagine a single cockroach being about the same dimensions as a hamburger bun, and therefore just the right size for a sandwich. Mm. Now imagine a dragonfly not just as big as your finger, but as big as your whole forearm. Or a centipede that isn't just as long as your foot, it's longer than you are. In the 1990s, there was a BBC documentary called Walking with Monsters that featured a giant carboniferous spider called Mesothele. And much as I enjoyed this documentary series, and I did, they made one big mistake and this was it. The giant spider they featured isn't a spider at all. The fossil that initially looked like a spider turned out to be a very spider-like eurypterid known as Megarachne that really was about the size of a house cat. Contrary to popular belief, there's never been a giant spider. The biggest spider fossil ever found was a two-inch member of the same family as today's orb weavers, and the biggest spider ever known is the modern Goliath bird-eating spider. They literally can't stand to be much heavier than that. At least the BBC series got the name right, but Mesothele isn't a species, it's a taxonomic clade. They're the oldest clade of spiders, too. They really did exist in the Carboniferous period, and there are a few species still around today. Arachnids are very closely related to Eurypterids and may even stem from them. Mesothele reveal that evident relationship with the retention of a vestigial trait shared with sea scorpions. These are the only spiders that still have the segmented armor plates on their abdomens that on Eurypterids would lead to a telson or stinger. So they resemble camel spiders as much as real spiders. Of course, animals with actual gills or lungs and a better way to support large bodies could get much bigger. In fact, there were freshwater fish at that time that were big enough to be considered lake monsters. With a mouthful of eight-inch long dagger-like teeth, these carnivorous, carboniferous fish could easily be man-eaters. The dominant tetrapods for much of that time were amphibians, with some getting to be as big as alligators. <laughs> Imagine being eaten by a newt. And this was a time of strange features no one understands, like the weird amphibian Diplocolis. Does it look like this? Or did it look like this? And in either case, why? Ancient times like these were not without their mysteries. Of course, this was also a period of unprecedented dramatic change, where transitions from fish to amphibians soon led to transitions from salamanders to frogs, and from amphibians to reptiliomorphs, like amniotic synapsids, where we left off in the last episode. Evolution is often described as a blind process because it's obviously not working toward any one particular goal. Instead, it tends to experiment in every direction at once, and we're going to see an example of that. We next look at Caseosauria, and we see these microcephalic fat aspids with really tiny heads. Now, these were among the first herbivorous tetrapods, although it looks like they lived on a diet of potato chips. You don't need a huge head with a gaping mouth and giant teeth to hunt down shrubbery because you don't have to chase down broccoli and subdue it on the run. And back when the worst predator on land was a salamander, you might get away with this. But there was an arms race going on, as we see in the sister clade of Eupelicosauria, or just pelicosaurs. The first subset here is Varanops, so-called because of a superficial similarity to monitored varanids like the Komodo dragon. Although I've, I've had a couple of giant varanids as pets, and I don't think there's much resemblance. Pelicosaurs are also the earliest examples of what are known as mammal-like reptiles. And that's indicated in the next clade with the skull of Archaeothyrus. Notice the caniform teeth? That's a mammal thing, not a reptile trait. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Then we look at Ophiocodon, which went the other way from Caseosaurs. 
Look at that huge head and that awful maw. This thing was a brute. If it ever got a hold of you to just bite off arms and legs at will with that industrial can opener mouth. And seriously, the way that jaw was mounted and the way the muscles were attached, it has more bite force than reptiles of that size. I imagine that serrated chomper would be perfect for biting off the tiny heads of the couch potatosaurus. On this next fork in the road, either path we take leads to the same mystery, because some, but not all, edaphosaurs wore these huge sails on their backs. Likewise, on the other path, some, but not all, sphenocodons also had these huge sails, and of course some only had short sails or none at all. We don't often see such a strange genetic trait turned on and off again so frequently, and this one isn't limited to synapsids either. This type of sail appeared on a couple of diapsids and one anaspid as well. Platyhistrix was an amphibian that lived at the same time as the sail-backed adaphosaurs and sphenocodons. So it's as if the late Carboniferous and early Permian was kind of like the late 1950s and early 60s when it was the fashion for a lot of American cars to have tail fins even if they came from different manufacturers. The purpose of these sail fins is uncertain, but at least for pelicosaurs, the primary function seems to have been thermal regulation. Since the atmosphere of the Carboniferous had such a high percentage of oxygen and relatively low greenhouse gas, it wasn't the hot tropical swamp that a lot of people imagine. In fact, by the late Pennsylvanian epoch and into the beginning of the Permian period, that world was a bit colder than today, with much of the Pangaean supercontinent covered in ice caps. As the effects of seasonal winters became more pronounced over a larger portion of the world, climate change devastated lycopod forests and left evergreen conifers in their stead. Fish and amphibians can usually handle chilly weather, but reptiles not so much. They were either restricted to increasingly narrow tropical regions, or they had to hibernate or find some other means of warming themselves. The dorsal spines of pelicosaurs were evidently connected by a membrane rife with blood vessels, meaning that if the animal turned their sail into the morning sun, it would act like a solar panel, allowing them to heat up and be active before contemporary competitors. But if it turned perpendicular or cut into the breeze, then it could also dissipate excess heat because they lived at a time of alternating warm and cold seasons. But what is most significant about sphenocodons is their teeth. If you look at the skull of a daphosaurus, you'll see a row of homodont teeth, and this is the standard for reptiles. Apart from very specialized venomous fangs and snakes, which haven't yet evolved by this point, reptilian teeth are pretty much all the same. They can bite and hold their prey, but then they might have to use gravity to help them swallow it, usually whole. Because their jaws are no more flexible than the hinges on a door, they can only open or close. But sphenocodons had muscles to swivel their jaw a bit and could thus actually chew, at least to a degree. They were certainly better at holding on to things that were struggling violently to get away, and they had heterodont teeth, meaning that they were differentiated. And look at our most famous cousin of this clade. Even if you don't know anything about paleofauna, you'll probably recognize this thing, and no, it's not a dinosaur. We're 16 episodes into the series so far, and dinosaurs are still a few episodes into the future, but not his future because he's more closely related to you than to dinosaurs. His name, Dimetrodon, means two different measures of teeth because it's possible to distinguish the incisors in, or caniforms from the standard reptilian teeth. That trait isn't unique to Dimetrodon either. It was common to all sphenocodons, having first emerged in basal pelicosaurs, as we saw. So while I'm sure you consider yourself more mammal-like than reptile and thus pelicosaur, look at your teeth and notice how they're differentiated. They don't all look the same. Now stick your chin out like this. That's something reptiles can't do, but these guys could. So do you accept your taxonomic classification? Because some of the other amniotes we saw look just like lizards, but Sphena kind of don't. 